All right, everybody. Welcome to PJ and the Beard. This is uh, conversation number 11 of our 19 conversations. And with us today, we're really excited about this. Um, we have David Barber from Barber Electronics. How you doing? All right, everybody. Welcome to PJ and the Beard. Oops. We're working. <laughs> yeah, that thing is that drives me crazy. Um, so, yeah, how are you, Dave? I'm doing well, considering, you know. Right, right. So, this is interesting because we did an interview with you. Uh, there's actually two parts. There's two interviews with you out on the channel right now. And then recently we did one of your pedals too. Uh, and you were kind enough to come over here. We did it when this was kind of pre social distancing and he was able to come over and hang out with us when we got to know David then. And so now to have you back, this live thing is really cool. Uh, so if anybody's watching yet, you're able to ask questions. We're able to, you know, it's really to let him kind of communicate with you. Uh, but before we get into that, two things that we've been doing with this 19 conversation things is we've been starting with kind of like an artist of the day that somehow relates to either the guest, something that we like, or something that's going on, and then a pedal of the day. So I'm going to pass it to Pat. And we're, we're kind of saving David for a second to get a couple people in here, but I see yeah. Brian Landreth is already in the chat. Uh, and I think... Yep. We were interviewing him the one day. He was hanging out with us the one day when you popped into the chat, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what do you have today, PJ? Yeah. So, you know, we've been doing this, and part of it was maybe a guitarist that I knew that Jason didn't know or ones that we recently heard of, and they're under the radar. This is far from under the radar, as many of you know from seeing news feeds today. Uh, we got a little break from our normal news to hear that Bill Withers passed away you know, who did uh, Lean On Me and Ain't No Sunshine and a, lot, a million songs you've probably heard. So we just went out and um, <clears throat> pulled a clip of one of his live performances where he's playing guitar. Honestly, I didn't know as much about Bill Withers as I should. But so our little featured artist for today is Bill Withers on the on tragic passing of him today. So here it is. Still about 30 seconds of that, right? All right, I'll just let it keep playing. I, I, I'm going to go back. I posted the video, the link to that in the... Uh chat and i saw magic matt popped in austin brown popped in over on facebook ken geist is in the house so um pedal of the day we we are not even gonna show any pedals today pat and i <laughs> pedal of the day obviously goes to david barber i brought the guy you. the guy who makes them <laughs> yeah okay i got a bunch here so um okay i'll start with what would have been an exclusive, um, this was going to be the new direct drive. Ooh. Oh, nice. See if I can get my like hand. Color. You had said that you had one green and you're waiting on that. And This does not seem to be coming to fruition. Oh, no. <laughs> I, really, I really wish it was. Uh, but the company that's been trying to make it for us has been trying for six months and they're having a problem with kind of a halo, you can't see it here uh, around the uh, the graphics, and I don't know why it's so hard, <laughs> you know, but um, it's turned out to be a really difficult thing. So we may have to change the graphic up a little bit. I'd still like to keep this color blue. I, like I don't it. know how well it comes off there, but I like that deep blue. I think that would be a nice change. And uh, the knobs are a black uh, knob with a brass bushing, and uh, even though they're plastic, they show up real well on, on stage. And that's turned out to be something about knobs that um, was kind of almost unexpected for me. People for a long time wanted cooler looking knobs and cooler looking knobs. And so we eventually went to these um, aluminum knobs like this. But as you can see, it's hard to see the pointers. And when you have bright stage lights, you really can't see them because they're reflective. And so I had a lot of people that would get the ones with the uh, silver knobs like this and they'd say, can I buy a set of the black ones from you with the uh, pointers on them that are in white because it's easier to see. So here's one. I'm, I'm really blowing all the cool pedals I could have been showing. Uh, these are, uh, this is a game changer uh, expanded. So that's a GCX. And uh, that had the black knob on it with the white pointer and that's still you know, a lot easier to see than the silver one, as you can see where the, where all the settings are. But the new one, the plastic, really against that stark white, really showed up well. 
Mm-hmm. And it does have a brass bushing, so it's still got you know all the all the working parts of the knob are still metal. So, and they do tend to hold up really well. Plastic knobs, if you whack them on something or if you drop them, um, the entire knob is black on the inside. Whereas an aluminum knob that's anodized black, as soon as you drop it, it knocks off the anodizing on the outside. It starts, you know, getting a relic look. <laughs> <laughs> so. That was going to be the new direct drive. I don't know whether it'll happen. Uh, it, somewhere between all of this stuff that's going on with uh, trying to change uh, enclosure manufacturers, and um, and I guess who can produce what right now? Who could even get raw materials? Who's allowed to produce in their state? Uh, seems to be affecting whether that's going to happen. So, I just want to go on record that we're okay with B stock if if it comes to that. Yes, Jason. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yes, you know I want a direct drive. <laughs> We'll take a limited edition uh, B-Stock. <laughs> well, this was the direct drive for a while. Right. And, I, and that's the same kind of graphic, just different colors than what I just showed you. Again, that's those bright uh, knobs that are really nice. They're expensive, but people claim they can't see them very well on stage, and I understand that. So that's something we're trying to be more responsive to. And then we had these green ones yeah. for all the British racing, British, British racing green. And that's pretty cool. Um, more pedals? Well, here's a, here's a, oh, here's a first part. question for you. So we can kind of jump back and forth between pedals and questions if you want. Uh, so okay. Why do pedals have less amp draw from power supplies when they run at higher voltage? I haven't measured that. <laughs> so... Um, Usually ours uh, running at nine volts are around 11 to 14 milliamps. They're very low. Um, I actually haven't uh, played with that, but I would imagine that Ohm's law gets in there. I'd have to, I'd have to look at it, but that just sounds like it would, would make sense if you're changing the voltage and the current would, would change because uh, the, uh, the draw of the pedals. Um, yeah, I think that would be something to do with, with Ohm's law. I'm sounding a little dumb right at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> you're smarter than the guy in the two windows above you, so you're good. Yeah, well, thanks, you know that's thanks Brian. <laughs> that's right. We, I had we noticed it, so to be honest with you, just off the top of my head, uh, it seems like if you have more voltage, you might have less current. Yeah. So, and anybody, so Ronnie uh, Statmeyer jumped in, and Layla's Guitar Daddy's in the house. So, so a bunch of people popping in and saying hi. So, Ronnie Santmeyer. Uh, builds all the custom shop pedals. Whenever you see anything that was built by uh, B Custom, that's Ronnie right there. So hi, oh, hey Ronnie, how you doing? And hi to Layla's guitar, Daddy. Right. That's his name. Yep. Yeah. So um, let's while we're waiting for another question here, let's let's hit another pedal. Can we go? Can we go back to the game changer in the bigger enclosure? Because we did an episode on the game changer, and you'll probably get to that. But what's what's different about that one? Okay, so game changer X was me kind of not doing the compact thing. This came out after the compact version of it, and there's things I like still about uh, larger boxes. It's 3.5 inches wide, so the average uh, guy who's wearing a pair of shoes that pair of shoes is, is usually wider than 3.5 inches wide. So narrow pedals sometimes are, are, are you know, a, a neat idea as far, as far as getting things close, but there's only so close you can go. And that is usually dictated by your foot unless you wear cowboy boots with the pointy, you know, tips on them or you take your shoes off and you play with your toes. So this is kind of at that, that limit, but it allows me to do more things. It puts four knobs on the top. Um, it still has the gain switch there. And it allows me to do things inside. Let's see if I can get that lined up. Like having, so I have three different trim pots there. And so by having those, the blue one is for the note shape. That decides how much bass is being fed into the overdrive circuit. So that decides if the overdrive sounds kind of loose or whether it sounds really tight. And then the next uh, knob uh, that's, I guess that's orange, I'm very colorblind, is, um, the bass knob, so you can adjust the bass to match your guitar and your amp. That's a nice thing to have. It's something that's hard to do with the compacts just because you run out of space. And then there's a presence knob, which is white. And again, that's the same thing. It really, uh, if you have a guitar like a Telecaster with those uh, top mount bridges uh, that tend to be um, bright, 
uh, and you need to knock back just the very top region of the, of the sound, you can do that. It knocks back the way it distorts in the top too, which is nice. Uh, at the same time, if you have something that's a little darker, if you just want uh, the guitar to really cut, you can turn that presence knob up. So that's kind of a neat thing about this. Um, and you can see that the mid-range knob that's on the top, uh, this guy here, is a dual pot. Now, oh, can I get that in there? Um, and because it's a dual pot, it's actually adjusting two different things at one time. It's changing the frequency of the mid-range at the same time it's, it's changing the amount of mid-range. So it's actually shifting the way the EQ works at the same time. So it's kind of doing the job that an engineer would do in a recording studio. And I tend to think along those lines of uh, how I responded to, to guitarists saying, I want more mids or I want this. You kind of carve out a place um, or you subtract a little bit uh, before you added certain mid-range frequencies so you didn't get too much of a, a blurry effect or something that's indistinct. And so that's a neat thing uh, on this. The same type of uh, control happens in the uh, Game Changer SR, except it's just three presets, whereas mm. this mid-range is continuous. You can continuously adjust all the way from um, the original LTD circuit, which has a bit of a mid-bump, down to the SR circuit, which is flat and anywhere in between. So that's a pretty neat thing. And it has a battery clip. So for guys that go to blues jams and they need to be able to attach a nine volt battery and just have one pedal to make their sound happen. This was for those guys too. So it was a lot of stuff that I wanted to be able to do. We made about 200 of those and then um, it went away. <laughs> All right. Nice. So a couple things here. Brian said that I met, I mentioned a pedal the other day that could run from nine to 18 volts as the volts went up it had less amp draw. And you know what, Brian, I can't remember what pedal that was or, or mentioning. <laughs> so you'll have to tell me what pedal that was. Um, and then Ryan or Riley asked how, there's a couple questions down here. So we'll try and hit these. Riley asked right. how many amps you test your pedals through when you're uh, developing. So currently I'm um, using three different amps uh, for the most part. I'm using a, Blackface Deluxe Reverb Reissue from Fender. And that's got an Eminence red, white, and blue speaker in it. I replaced the original speaker that came in the uh, one that I had because I thought it sounded more, um, more neutral, had a more even response. But we use that amp because it's one of the most popular amps. And as far as, you know, um, what people typically use for um, their bass or their, you know, their uh, tone or their their clean amp that they use for pedals or pedal platform. That's the word I was looking for. Um, black face style fenders, silver face style fenders, which are very similar. That's kind of the thing that you expect. That's, that's the majority. Even if it's somebody making a channel switching amp, they, they tend to make their clean sound sound a lot like a fender. So that's one that we always do. I also have a Marshall or origin 20 right now that I'm using for kind of the, the Marshall style sound, but I modified it a bit to act more like an old four input uh, Marshall uh, because the Origin 20 just has a lot of low cut so that it, uh, when you crank it up, which is what it's meant to do, it's meant to be just kind of a, you know, let the fur fly kind of amplifier in, in an old style way, but they wanted to keep it really tight. So they cut a tremendous amount of lows and, and they gave you no way to really put them back. The bass knob won't retrieve what's been lost. And the, um, uh, there's really not much you can do on that. So I replaced one capacitor, and this one capacitor uh, was limiting uh, how much lows came. It was a cathode cap. Uh, that was a one microfarad, and I, I bumped up to 47, which is you know somewhere in between where they are now and where they were back when they made like JTM 45s, things like that. It works great as a pedal platform, and it works great for being the Marshall side of how I voice pedals. And then I have an AC15 C1, which I don't think sounds terribly Vox-like, uh, even though it's a Vox amp and they're marketing it that way. Uh, it does have some solid state circuitry in the middle so that the reverb can work out pretty well and you can't really avoid, even if you turn the reverb off, you still are flowing through some solid state stuff. And the tone stack on those amps has been modified by Vox to act a little bit more uh, like the way a tone stack works in Fender amps, even though it has the component values that you find in a Vox, um, the bass and the treble knobs don't really work in that really idiosyncratic way that they worked with um, uh, the original Vox amplifiers. And there was also a couple of bright caps I had to cut out on that one. I use that less than I use the Marshall 
and the um, and the Fender. And then the other thing I use is the Barber Echelon amp that we have that I made. Uh, gosh, it's been 15 years ago now. That that can produce the sound of a lot of different types of amplifiers. And then we have things like a Doctor Z, um, Carmen Ghia, uh that I get to sometimes. So there's kind of a plethora of things. I have a Boss Katana to just do the popular solid state amp. I don't think that amp sounds really good, but it's one of the things that we use to try to make sure that the voicing of the pedal uh, works with those. And then I probably have 10 or 15 guitars with different pickups in them that are popular at this time. Um, that once again, I'm you know trying to voice with those and, ma and make things work. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> I think um, two things here. Well, there's another question though. There's, there's a couple other questions. Um, and then what, uh, Brian was talking about that pedal that I showed. I don't know if you'll be able to see that, but on the back, um, it talks about if you run it at nine volts, it takes 450 milliamps, 12 volts, 250 milliamps, and eight. Okay. So that's where he was. That's so where that. Double, if you double the voltage, the current cuts in half, or right about in half. About in half. Yeah. That would well, sound like Ohm's law works to me, but I could be off on that. Who makes the pedal? Uh, that's a Hampstead. That makes like amps, Hampstead amps and stuff. Okay, all it's all analog. Yeah, I think so. And it draws 250 milliamps. It says at nine volt, it takes 450 millivolt. Million. That's a lot for a solid state pedal. Is it not a solid state pedal? The tremolo. I don't know. It's a tremolo. Oh. I'm thinking it's all analog. Yeah. yeah, it's an analog tremolo pedal. Wow, that's all. It's actually the uh, it's actually the tremolo circuit they put in their amps. Ha. Huh. I have an interesting answer to uh, Mike McIani. I don't know if I'm his name right. Mm -hmm. But um, if you'll give me a second, I can respond to his question. I have to leave for a second. I'll be back in a minute, less than a minute. Okay. Do it. I'll be right back. Um, Jason will write you a hall pass. <laughs> yeah. So um, Austin had a question here. Can you explain the best way to set up your pedals on a pedal board for ultimate? Optimal sing, single flow. Wow, can't speak. Um, and I, I'm sure David's answer would be better than mine, but maybe the same as, you know, we've always been that kind of uh, drive pedals into delay, into reverb. Modulation is the, is the, is the interesting one because some modulation sounds better in front of drive and some after, but what, okay. What was Mike's? Do you know how to pronounce his last name? Because I don't want to botch it too bad. McEnany. Uh, McEnany, yeah. There you go. All right, Mike McEnany. Um, he asked about uh, using phantom power to power pedals. Well, we worked with a company called P3, and we designed this pedal, which is a phantom-powered pedal. So uh, the power supply comes from your amplifier. So it's built into the amp. I believe Fuchs made some amps that had it built in. And you can also get a, uh, a box that sat on top of your amp. And then you used a special cable that allowed it to carry the DC along with the audio. That brought it out to the pedals. The pedals then had switches on the bottom for how it passed through the voltage. And it was an idea that I'd had for a long time to be able to do phantom uh, powered pedals. And then I got, a guy, I got a call from a guy named Jason Roebling who owns uh, DC Voltage, who makes the P3 pedals. And um, he was looking to talk to, di to designers of pedals about making um, their own designer series for his phantom powered uh, pedals. So he had bought the patent or he uh, paid for the maintenance of a patent that had existed previously. And then he made some changes uh, to it. So he owned the, 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 the patent on this. So that's why a lot of manufacturers aren't doing it because it costs money to be able to do it. And I think that's one of the things that I would guess has hurt um, how uh, common this has become. I thought it was something that would work um, best if it was open source and there could just be a standard that people could use and it didn't cost every pedal designer money and then they had to add that to the cost because it just didn't seem like where the pedal industry was, go was going at the time, especially since pedals started needing so many different voltages and polarities out at the uh, pedal board. And this only offered nine volts um, as far as the voltage and it didn't offer uh, positive polarity. So you couldn't use an old fuzz face. So there was things that, um, you had to work around a bit. And so it faced a bit of problems there. I believe he still sells them for a person who's committed to the idea of a phantom powered board. You can buy the pedals from him and, and the stuff sounds good and works well. This is a basically a direct drive um, that I designed uh, for him. 
And it's also got a built in, um, we used to make a buffer called a B buff. And so the B buff could operate at unity gain, but it also had uh, a knob. So you, if you wanted your unity when you bypass the pedal to actually be stronger than unity gain, and some pickups work really well with a little bit of extra push, that was already built into the pedal and the bypass. Uh, and then you could switch that off and go back to just regular true bypass uh, if you wanted to. So yeah, um, there are phantom powered pedals and we made them. Or actually we designed them and he made them. That's really cool. What do you think about Austin's question here? He's asking the best setup for pedals on a pedal board for ultimate optimal signal flow. The best, uh, what? Best setup for pedals on a pedal board for all optimal signal flow. Signal flow. Wow, why can I not say that? Jeez, that's the like third time. Um, and and whose question? I want to read that question and see if I can understand it. It's up on your screen. I, I have it shown underneath your picture. Oh, can you explain the best way to set up? I don't think I understand. Um, to set them up, do you mean um, one after another as far as the sequence of them? And that's what I was thinking. He was talking about single, uh, you know, single order path. of chain, yeah. single path. Okay. So there's a lot of different things that um, types of pedals that you can call gain. So um, EQ is a form of gain. It's just per frequency. Compression is a form of gain. It's automatically adjusting itself. Um, and obviously overdrive, boost, and distortion and fuzz pedals, which are marketing terms for all the same thing, distortion pedals. Um, all those things are gain. So I like gain stuff towards the front. How with guitar, there's not like um, perfect set rules because there's different agendas that you might have. If you want to push your fuzz, then your fuzz that has to be after something that can push it. So a boost pedal or an overdrive pedal or something like that. Um, and in a lot of cases, you don't want to push a fuzz because a, a if you like the way Jimi Hendrix used a, uh, a fuzz face, it's important that it's connected directly to the output of the guitar and that there's not a, um, a treble bleed cap on the, on the pot because that'll affect how it works because it's everything about the impedance of the guitar and how it interfaces with the impedance of a fuzz face. I believe we talked about that in one of our last uh, conversations. So that would need to be first in that case. Um, sometimes you want a wah to be first um, before your overdrive, if you want to kind of limit the effect of the wah and have it just feed frequencies uh, to the wah. If you want the wah to have a really wide range, then you want it after the overdrive pedals. You always want your time-based stuff last, um, unless you're trying to make your time-based stuff sound ugly on purpose. And I guess there's good reason uh, for that, just not for me and not for most uh, people. But usually you put that uh, last. Sometimes an EQ last makes sense. Uh, if you're just looking to um, have an overall impact on the sound of the amplifier that you're using. So um, something like our barbecue that we made. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the segue in the transitional material. Um, so uh, the barbecue uh, gave you the sound of either a blackface. And when I say the sound, I mean the EQ of a blackface amp, uh, of a tweed of a large tweed amp or of a Marshall amplifier. And so this worked great if you had an amplifier that had a volume and a tone knob, say something like um, a tweed deluxe. It was great with that. You could plug it into your tweed deluxe and make your tweed deluxe sound like a blackface deluxe with cathode bias. So that's a pretty neat thing too. So you'd want this EQ to be last. I won't keep pushing my pedal that I don't make anymore. Um, <laughs> nah. well, we're, gonna bring, we're gonna bring that back in a compact form at some point. But so sometimes you would want that EQ last. A lot of times you want it first, like you would put it, like a lot of people use their boss graphic EQs really early in the chain because they want to push an overdrive pedal, you know, and they want to push a certain frequency. So with guitar, you have to ask yourself, what am I trying to do? What is my objective? And that dictates what your sequence is, but it's typically gain and then uh, time base, just to break it down into simple things. But um, you're you just try it, right? You just try it. Yeah. Move the pedals around and see what sounds good to That's you. That's it. That's it. I get so many emails about what should I do, and I'm always trying to explain you're not going to hurt anything. You know, just don't put your pedals after your amplifier, and you're good. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. Um, and trying to get people to listen. But, you know, so like for me, I put compression before overdrive 
because sometimes I want to use it to, you know, kind of uh, add a little bit of sustain to the overdrive. And if you put compression on and it's after overdrive, it tends to kind of tighten up and put a little bit of a, uh, like a blanket across the overdrive itself. Sometimes you want that if you've got kind of a, a raspy sounding overdrive, sometimes a, a compressor, compressor will calm it down a little bit. So. All right. So in the chat, um, there's a couple things here. Magic Matt said that he has the direct drive super sports um, mm -hmm. that he says has some kind of special mojo. And I know from our interview, if uh, he said that's been on his board for 10 years and I'm kind of in the same situation. I've had a direct drive. I have the old big box versions of the direct drive um, magic Matt. I would just say, right. That's the exact one of the three that, that we have over here of that, that, that era. And I would say check out that new that new one, uh, the new. Um, oh, he is talking about direct draft. Yeah, I, I'm I'm going for the new one. Uh, and then there was another. Uh, there's a couple more questions here. Um, what's this one? I have three barber pedals on my current board: original big box direct drive and LTD SR, as well as a game changer SR set to the unlimited gain with the SR mid range. Oh, thanks for making awesome pedals. <laughs> Thank you. Not a question, but yeah. And Ronnie's bringing up the Linden EQ uh, that he uses last in the chain. Ronnie Santmeyer is uh, in order to uh, make a small amp or a cheap amp, as he's calling it, sound bigger. So there it is. That's a Linden EQ, and we currently make those. And they're primarily used by bass amp uh, bass players because it's like an Ampeg style EQ. It's called a back sandal uh, EQ. And so it's got bass and treble frequencies and then it's got a toggle that adjusts um, the tightness of the sound. So it basically does what the input jacks do on an Ampeg amp or summer bright and summer normal. And then you've got a response switch for the EQ. And that response switch um, allows you to decide where the mid dip, if there's going to be one is. But the way this works, you can get a fairly flat response um, with the bass up a little bit, the treb treble kind of at 12 o'clock. That's just the weird way that that Ampeg uh, back sandal EQ worked. And um, uh, from there, you can actually boost or cut frequencies. But Ronnie's talking about pushing a little bit of bass, a little bit of top, and it's a really smooth sounding EQ um, for both guitar or bass. But again, primarily you see bass players uh, using these. Uh, EQs. If I could only hold this up to the camera and work backwards. Okay, I'm good. I know it's weird. It is very weird. All right. Uh, another question from Chris Wolf. This is on the GCX that you showed. Yep. Uh, he said uh, had a presence. I'm sorry, presence base and note shape. He says his has a high presence, high presence, low, and bass. Is that just nomenclature change, or are there different versions? Now, I don't remember that having two. Maybe I made a version that way. I just don't remember it right now. Um, there was a game changer, or there was a half gainer. I brought so many props. Um, <laughs> That's good. Um, and uh, I believe some of these may have had more than one presence knob. That This one's got note shape, presence, and bass, and then a mid-range knob on top like the GCX did. Um, I guess it's possible that I made a GCX with two uh, presence controls because it did have two different levels of gain. And for each level of gain, you can have a separate presence control. So it, it's possible uh, that his had that. I just don't remember it. I got hit in the head about three weeks ago uh, while walking my dog and got a concussion. So it's possible that I, I really did. So it's possible that I'm kind of brain farting on this a little bit. No. I would have I would have predicted you to have a concussion based on your aggressive mountain bike riding, but no, around. I had to stop mountain biking because of this silly dog that attacked me. Um, but I'm, I'm I'm slowly coming around. But but I really could be not thinking straight about that. I just don't remember having uh, our direct drive dual channel, which was a, a a dual pedal like this where it had a on off and a channel switch that had two presence uh, controls on it for sure. I just don't remember this pedal having it, but it, it may have, I mean, the GCX may have been that. 
Brian asked, uh, on the very high gain pedals, it's fun to play with the sustain and touch sensitivity, but it's a fizzy mess. Is there a way to get touch and sustain on a lower gain pedal? Uh, maybe stack it with a compressor. Well, the more things that you stack, the more noise that you have. So most pedals that either compress um, or overdrive or distort, a lot of them are multiplying. And so let's say you start off with a noise of one, and then you, in order to, to build up sustain, you multiply at times 1,000. So now you've got a noise of 1,000. And then you put another pedal behind it that multiplies it by another 100. So the noise can become you know, pretty extreme with that. So you're trying to, um, you know, and, and in that example, we started off with a noise, uh, noise level of just using the number one as a representation. That would be pretty small on a scale of things if like very noisy was considered to be a thousand, but it kind of gets, gets away from you as you multiply things. So you want to try to get as, as the complete gain product that you want from one, one device whenever popular. This stacking has gotten super popular. It's been around now for over 20 years and I've never been a big proponent of stacking. I always would think you're better off to get the maximum gain that you want from one pedal and so our dirty bomb was just for that. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> there is more. And so the dirty bomb was meant to have the kind of gain that you would expect to get from stacking two pedals. And it had a great name. It did not ship overseas very well. Um, as you can imagine, with a name like that, customs took some time when we were shipping overseas. <laughs> but, um, but it was fun nonetheless. And it had a sub bass trim pot on the interior. If you can, that guy right there. And uh, that could get pretty thumping. It could uh, get you into the territory of like Foo Fighters type sounds and things like that. So you could get some pretty uh, strong uh, distortion out of that. But as far as controlling fizz, while a lot of, you know, guitar is a pretty ugly thing in the first place. If you, if you properly set up the impedance to plug a guitar, even a great vintage guitar like a 59 Les Paul or an old 52, Telecaster, if you plug it into a mixing console uh, with a direct box, you tend to have to do a decent amount of EQ and use some compression to keep it from sounding pretty rough. And then the overdrive pedals that add distortion to them aren't making the sound a lot prettier. What usually happens is it hits the amp and it hits that speaker that has really limited frequency response and that rounds everything off. That's the kind of the magic thing at the end. But some amps, some amps aren't so magic. Some amps have a lot of what we call bright caps in them, and you hear a lot of, you know, the bright cap being vilified, and it should be vilified. Oh, I should mention, on my deluxe reverb reissue, I either only play the normal channel, which does not have a bright cap, or if I plug into my um, vibrato channel, I took the, the 47 Pika Ferry bright cap off the volume pot, which is a common mod on those because it does make it difficult with overdrive pedals. So. Bright caps allow just the highest frequencies to pass while the rest of the, the frequencies are, are, are kind of limited. And so that's when that happens with an overdrive pedal, when it sees that, it really makes the top end feel fizzy and extra bright. And that can also happen with speakers that have very small voice coils. So those popular one inch voice coils on, Gen on Jensen speakers, if you think about it, um, that's great when you crank the amp up and you make the speaker distort on its own and everything's kind of at its limit. It tends to give it that creamy top end. But if you have to play at a more reasonable level, uh, if you think about it, a tweeter, a really common size driver for a tweeter is a one inch tweeter. And so that one inch coil on like a, a typical Jensen, uh, you know, 10 inch uh, speaker with, with one inch coil, vent what I'm trying to get at is that vintage design. Uh, that tends to really push a lot of trouble unless you push the speaker very hard and that can add to that fizz too. So like I, I tell a lot of guys, if you need a volume controllable rig, use a larger voice coil, um, something with a, uh, something called a Zaret dust cap, a little bit of doping on the speaker often helps that shiny stuff that you see around the perimeter of the speaker. All those things help to contribute that kind of runaway harmonics in the top when you're playing at low to medium levels. Once a guitar amp gets loud, it starts to do a lot of things. As you turn the volume knob up, it tends to get rid of the bright cap. It actually gets rid of the resistance that's across, uh, uh, or actually limits, the resistance gets so small again across that cap, I should say, that the cap is not affecting anything anymore. When the amp's all the way out, most of those bright caps are gone. So uh, a lot of people think that's the amp sounding creamy. You're really just getting rid of the bright cap as you turn the volume knob up. Um, 
And that's when speakers start compressing more as you turn them up, they also tend to sound creamier. So all these things tend to you know, be what, what makes you think that an overdrive pedal or distortion pedal is fizzy at low levels. The truth is it's a whole bunch of stuff happening or not happening at once that makes pedals fizzy. Once again, you have to end up thinking a whole lot and really working through these problems. Um, here in the chat, Magic Matt said uh, that he sees Ronnie's name in a lot of his Barber products and just sent out a thank you to him and a little shout out to him. I thought that was cool. Um, Chris Wolf had said that his also had a green board and it looked like the one that you had up had a yellow board. And I think that's back to that game changer plus that. So that is a prototype board. Okay. So when we make our first run of them and they're the same quality boards, the only thing they don't have is they don't have the green solder resist on them, which it makes it a little bit easier for us to build when it has solder resist on it because um, it's harder to pull solder across two traces when you have that, that resistive uh, uh, coating on there. So um, it's basically the same thing, just the different boards are just when we very first are prototyping things, we, the prototype boards don't have solder resist on them. And you know that because I didn't have a link for your website in the <laughs> description. I just am throwing that in the chat right now. Yeah, Guitar Hack uh, think, checking in. Oh, cool. And Jack the Rabbit, too. Yeah. What else do I have? Um, do you have more questions? Yeah, I, I haven't read this one yet. We know that you're the master of gain. So he's apologizing if it's been asked already, but he's always wondered, has David ever thought about venturing into modulation or other time-based effects? Uh, I'm not the right guy for it, um, mainly because I don't have a strong appreciation for it. Um, I don't tend to like things that, that go, wow, 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 you know, even though I have my favorite vibe pedal with me, the Digitech. The it's it's great that you have the one like kind of Leslie rotary effect pedal that we probably didn't do. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's got that drive in it, and and it does a lot of cool effects. And I actually like that one because I can get a pretty cool organ sound out of it with my guitar. Um, but um, time based effects, delay and reverb. I think the big guys like Boss uh, and obviously Strymon. I, I think they do such a good job. I don't think I would. I would be just trying to to make a little money on the side by making one. I wouldn't do it as well as them. And my company's not big enough to get the custom made chips and things and, uh, to program those chips um, to do it, to be honest with you. I would just be completing my pedal line and rounding it out. And so I, I've never been, I'm not very shark tank. I'm not thinking about <laughs> how can I scale this, you know, or anything like that. It's, it's really, uh, I make what I like, you know? So um, it's a good question, but uh, yeah, I've, there's there's people who do the modulation stuff who have a great appreciation for what modulation sounds like. It's it's not me. I'm I'm a pretty traditional guitar player. I plug in, I play. I want to hear good overdrive. I want to hear good compression. I want to be able to have a tool like EQ to use. Um, Launchpad is another uh, thing that I made, which is uh, a way to correct a lot of problems with amplifiers. It's, it's a really good boost pedal. Um, clean. I mean, really clean. This thing has got like 27 volts. Um, on the circuit itself. It triples the voltage from your nine volt battery and the barbecue did that too. And so did the Linden EQ. All of those triple the voltage coming off of your nine volt input. So you don't need to use a higher uh, voltage uh, supply, but it gives you all that extra headroom. And so this one, what it did was it would allow you with a Marshall, um, you have on the older ones, four inputs and you can jack both channels together. And a lot of people like the sound of that, but they always ask the same question. Why can't I jack both the, the channels together on my deluxe reverb, on my super reverb, on my Vibralux? And the answer to those is because those two channels are out of phase with each other. If you jack them together, it'll just sound like you're holding your nose and making an electric kazoo sound. So this has two separate outputs, that side, for each phase. And so you, it corrects the phase problems with those Fender amps and allows you to play both channels together if you want to. And then it has volume controls for each the positive and the negative phase. So you can decide how hard you want to hit each channel 
of your uh, blackface amp. So it allows you to get a lot of new sounds from blackface and silverface uh, oh. Fender amplifiers that you didn't think you could get. You can even set it up to have uh, two different levels. You can use it as an AV box, use, use it as a direct box to a mixing console. So it was kind of the Swiss, Swiss army knife of sounds that um, this one pedal could do. And we made this for a long time and I will bring this back at some point. Launch pad. Get through so Next, next, next question. And if I missed, we we got guys in here like Guitar Hack. Guitar Hack does this live stream all the time. has a and has a great following uh, over there doing that. And he's you know he's good at like managing this many things. So if I miss one, if I miss you, just tag us and, and ask the question again. Uh, but I have a question here. I'm going to give part of the answer for it. So Ken okay. Geist, who I know is a friend with PJ, said, mm -hmm. if time allows, could you give a little elevator pitch about the Exacta Fuzz and would it appeal to a guy whose only other Fuzz pedal is an EH3034? My you know answer is no, he can't. <laughs> he cannot give you the quick elevator pitch. I don't have elevator. Right. His, his elevator goes to the hundredth. My mom should have named me Loquacious. <laughs> um, so um what is an eh3034 i don't know is it like um, harmonics question. electro harmonics perhaps yeah 34 um yeah so great was looking that up uh tone poet is checked in um so it's just so a vintage big, big muff okay it's a big muff okay so we made the the um trifecta, um, which was three different versions. We talked about this before on one of the other episodes that we did. Uh, basically vintage big muff style circuits. They weren't all made by electroharmonics. There was the triangle uh, sound that was in there, but there was also sounds from the Vox big muff clone and from the Supa uh, big muff clone. And I wanted to not just have those three sounds. So, so you had three different types of uh, big muff sounds. I wanted to add some of my own things to it. So what I added was um, a sludge control, which is a great name next to fuzz, you know, sludge and fuzz. So that decided how much bass was fed into the circuit. It could make a fuzz, which is typically very sludgy, um, sound a lot smoother and allow you to get more use from the EQ control. And then the other thing we added was a flat response switch for the tone control. So that's all been repackaged into the Exacto, which is good for you. And um, it's got a three-way selector switch for the sludge. So you got your three different levels of full on somewhere in the mid and, and cut back. And that allows you to get more use from your tone control. Uh, and then there's uh, another switch that allows you to switch between different versions, uh, two different versions now of the uh, big muff style circuit. And then there's also a flat response version of it. So uh, it kept all the best stuff of the trifecta and we repackaged that as the exacta. So that's my elevator pitch. I want to go longer. I really do, but I'm going to try. <laughs> well, in the in the comments right now, there's a lot of people talking about. Uh, I don't know a lot of people, but there's been a couple comments. Um, any info? This one here. Any info on the bus would be awesome. Uh, what makes this one so touch sensitive? It cleans up amazing. And then a couple. Somebody else said that they they love that pedal. And you haven't talked about this one yet, have you? No, he has not. The boss. The no, you didn't bring this one with you the other last nope. time you're here. That's because it was popular, so I discontinued it. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. This is what smart Ooh. business men do. This Leave them one more. By not Shark Tank over here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the bus was, you'll notice the fonts are slightly different on the logo. So the BU is for burn unit, and the SS is for the Super Sport direct drive. So this had a switch that would allow you to go between the sounds of the burn unit. And it was, it's an earlier burn unit sound. So the burn unit did a lot of different types of sounds. I always jokingly called the burn unit the analog modeler because, it, and we brought that out in 1998, before modeling the digital really got very popular. But um, it could do tweed sounds. It could do uh, uh, just straight up boost sounds. And it did a great dumble impression. And I had a dumble that I was able to work with at the time and uh, I modeled the sound very closely after that. And that's what's kind of included in this, is the sound that a lot of people want, is that, that fat, squawky, mid-range, kind of Robin Ford, Larry Carlton kind of thing. And then you, you hit the switch and you have 
the super sport sound. So I made this so I, there would be a compact version of the burn unit and the super sport because people were asking me for both. And again, like I told you in the, one of our earlier our interview when I came over, I like to make a lot of value. I like to make pedals that have, you know, a couple of pedals in them if I can. Um, and then the other switch is for harmonics and dynamics because the burn unit had a really cool dynamics knob on that. And I couldn't fit that on here. So I just made some presets for the harmonics control from the uh, Super Sport and the dynamics. And they can be applied to either sound. So that was a burn unit. And there's the dynamics control, if you can read that. And the burn unit had two channels. There was an early version that only had one channel. But it's got two drives, two volumes, a dynamics control, a tone control. And then on the interior, there's more trim pot fun. There's a bass, there's a mid-range, there's a presence. And there was a note shape on the last version that we made too. Um, and this was probably wired by Rania. Yeah, it says Ronnie in there. See how neat it is? That's because Ronnie's unbelievable. He's an artist when it comes to uh, electronics. <laughs> wow. uh, Hack asked, how is the voltage boosted on a 9-volt DC source? Was that from uh, one of the things you were oh, talking about? Oh, it uses the DC to DC uh, converter. So it, it's just a little uh, switching supply that, that you know boosted up. Uh, you can make it go 18 or you can make it go... Uh, 27. I'd love to make the dual discrete again. That, that's a Ronnie thing. You know, that, that's a matter of me coordinating, um, answering the question from Tone Poet. Sorry. Yep. Um, uh, so yeah, we'd like to make those again. That, that was something where people could choose a couple of our different pedals and put them into a pedal. It was called dual discrete because there was two completely discrete electronics uh, or distortion circuits in one pedal. So they had their own tone control for each, their own bass, their own mid-range, all their own trim pots. It gave you a lot of control on a fairly small space. <laughs> Am I supposed to answer the Jack the Rabbit question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see um, a question mark at the end, so I think it's no. And then Hack says he has to have you on the show. He, okay. he, he, does, he does a weekly um, live stream like this and has a really loyal following of people. I yeah. know some of the people that go to the Hack show are in here. Um, I, I would, you know, it'd be, it'd be a good time. I'd watch. Okay. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people would tune in. There's a lot of people tuning in right now um, for, for our size channel. I, I thank you, everybody, that is tuning in. And we do have plans. I, I mean, maybe now's the time because Pat and I are about the worst self-promoters in the world. But um, Almost as bad as David. Oh, well, yeah. Almost, almost, as as <laughs> almost as bad as David. But we are <laughs> planning. This was never supposed to happen. This live stream was never supposed to happen. What was supposed to happen is that we were going to go down and visit him at his shop, do another video there at the shop. Obviously, right now, current situation, that's not going to happen anytime soon. But in the interest of self-promotion, if you subscribe to the channel, you know, that will hopefully be coming up in the future. So, right. yeah, so please subscribe. Um, everybody go... What's to say? Everybody go watch the interview. Yeah, definitely go watch his interviews. I mean, if you like this, we did, like I said, we, yeah, he came over. We were here for a long time. It turned into two interviews. Uh, it's in two different parts. He does, you do, David does some deep dives into some of this stuff that, you know, if you want to know more about it. Um, oh, yeah. And we're only, we're only about, thanks, Brian. We're only about, I don't know, 80 people away from, from a thousand subs now. So uh, we're looking forward to that. And to that point, thanks to Hack, uh, Music Therapy, Laz uh, said he's here because of Hack, so that's good. Glad you guys can join in and tap into the wisdom of David Barber. And here we come to a very nice and unique compression pedal. Yeah, that, is that is that a new color for that? I like the dark. You're killing this, Dave. Like you came over to your – oh, you're, oh, there you go. See, we were hoping that we would have kept more of your pedals when you came over because we'd say we can't send them back to you because they have cooties. But uh, – I see we got a black, like a blackout. Uh, yeah, what, what's the series blackout thing going on here? This is the only ones. It's a set of four. So, those are cool. <laughs> I had one set made, and there probably won't be another of this kind of uh, blackout. That's not a bad name for it. I haven't really come up with the marketing yet. Because once again, bad at Shark Tank. <laughs> I do like it though. Yeah. Now, and we have we have your 
tone press over here that I need. I need and, to give his tone press back to him because I already own a tone press. I need to pay him for the game changer. I haven't <laughs> forgotten about that. And he needs, and I'm kind of holding them hostage until he actually can cough up a, a new direct drive for me is what's going on here. That'll be, that'll be months with what's going on, I think, because it's um, one of the guys that builds for me is in Maryland. Ronnie's in a combination of Maryland and um, uh, Delaware. And so there's a lot of that that's kind of shut down now to a certain extent. It's it's not really easy to, to work with what's going on. And I can't get enclosures at the moment. I, I've been trying to get enclosures for six months. And, you know, but well before any of this with COVID-19 was going on, it's just that a very large um, enclosure manufacturer that many pedal builders used closed down last summer. Yeah. And the workload that's been put on the other guys that are that want to pick up the slack, um, they're having a hard time managing it you know, who they're going to make pedals for. And uh, apparently I didn't throw enough money or, or something. I'm not sure what it is, but um, yeah, we just have not been able to get enclosures. I email them every week. It's something where I stay on them. Um, oh, by the way, I, I should say this, this little collector set is available. It, it'll be the only of those four. So that's my shark tank. Good moment. Good job. <laughs> um, should we ask how much? I'll have to. I'll have to come yeah. up with that. How much for the absence of pigmentation? <laughs> How much colors? for what? For the absence of the pigmentation in the colors. Exactly. <laughs> They're just mildly hey, pigmented. Well, you said you're you're colorblind. You, we could tell you that pedals any color we want to. <laughs> well, they were going to be <coughs> um, the the next black and what the next black series that we did, but because our relationship with the other company ended because they went away. Um, that company was just mismanaged, so they, they evaporated. They'd been around for a long time, but they'd always kind of been on the precipice of death. So uh, that was the last set that we got from them. It was, it was supposed to be a, a run of probably hundreds of each of those, but um, not to be. So now they're a collector set, and I, uh, I've been sitting on them for a little while, but I realized I probably should sell them when I can't, since I can't make any other products right now. That's right. So they'll be a Charlie. Great. Charlie Rowe asked what would be a good uh, – what would you recommend for, like, the Holdsworth tone? Charles Rowe used to work uh, with us. So uh, he's another guy who uh, built pedal course. He's a fantastic guitar player, uh, really good music instructor. Um, for Holdsworth, um, the burn unit was always the best one for that. It's currently not around. But Charles built an awful lot of burn units, so he probably knows. Charles was also involved in another pedal company that I had called Nuance Effects. So, hi, Charles. How you doing, buddy? I hope all is well. Uh, someone, yeah. Jack, oh, I'm jumping in here, Jason. Yeah, you go ahead. Up, you had to get up and answer because the 90s were calling on your house. Phone. I know, and I yelled at my wife. And you know they just want to sell me a medical brace or extended warranty for my car. I don't know why that phone is even in the house, but she will not let us get rid of it. Jack the Rabbit had an interesting question, given the, 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 the situation that you said. You know, is it possible to print, to 3D print enclosures? Is that... They need to be metal. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess you can probably 3D print metals too, but um, I don't know anybody who has anything that does that. I certainly don't have one. I don't think enclosures are difficult to get. I don't think they're difficult to drill. We used to um, buy enclosures directly from New Sensor for a long time. We drilled them ourselves in our own shop. We would drop them off at a local powder coater. And then we would pick them up from the powder coater. We would take them to the silk screener who was also local and they would put silk screen on, on them. And then about 10 or 15 years ago, a company called Foresight Electronics, who then later be called, became Mammoth Electronics, they, they solicited us. They, they called us on a pretty regular basis and said, we can take over your work. We can do it for the same price or better. Um, and we can, uh, your, we can improve your turnaround and we can stop you from having to drive to the powder coater and to the silk screener. And that sounded pretty good. And for the first year or so, it went pretty well with our comp. And I, I, I took on that when we went to our compact enclosures. I thought, well, this is a good time. I need a new enclosure anyway. So, But um, over the years, the management of the company was really dodgy. It's that typical thing um, where there wasn't enough people that were business-minded there. There was too many people that were friends and enjoyed partying together in whatever ways. And uh, it was just really difficult to get consistency out of them and to get accurate information out of them. And eventually uh, the money that was keeping that company alive uh, 
it it stopped and it didn't matter how you know much product we all bought from them and or how quickly we paid there was no way around it that they were just mis uh, managed so suddenly the other guys that could offer the same service could name their price they could name their turnaround time and apparently they can also be pretty slow if, if, if they uh need to be like i say six months and we've gotten I think three or four prototypes and right now they're trying to work out a problem with their printer. And I hope they do. Um, it's been a long time. I understand it's a difficult transition to suddenly handling a lot more pedal companies than you were before, but right. at some point you got to do what you do. You know, so you're making closures and drill them, make them and drill them. And, I mean, you're, you're not, it's, it's what people understand. You're not like, I'll just take whatever you can give me. You're pretty exact. Yeah. And like you were talking earlier on that yeah. direct drive, Okay, there's a little bit of shadow there. I still, I need them now. I want a hundred of them. You're like, no, we need to make it right. No, they always have to be 100 percent right. We rejected an awful lot of enclosures over the year with that company uh, that we were working with, and you know they would take returns, and that was a good thing about that. And but there was an awful lot of returns over over the year. So yeah, if we see any kind of orange peeling that we don't like, um, if the uh, graphic itself isn't aligned perfectly, if it's not the correct color. Um, if the holes aren't, you know, correct, if they're not, you know, what they should be, then yeah, we send the stuff back, but you know, it's difficult because you end up sending back as much as you actually find, uh, acceptable. Um, I hope that's not going to be the case much longer. There's a couple other guys I have a choice to go with, you know, just a matter of finding somebody who's more responsible, um, and looks at this from more of a business standpoint, uh, and not, this is a fun party time, you know? Because it's not a party when you can't deliver. Right. Yeah. You got to have money to party, right? <laughs> I think you have to fight for the right, actually. Yeah, I've heard that somewhere. <laughs> nice. So do you see any other questions popping up, Pat? I just see a lot of, like, positive comments. And um, there was a new name. Yeah, you saw Mark Legassi. It's like, I guess. Uh, and then I can't see there was, like, a Blackjack Guitar Nut, I think. It was a new name that I saw here. Uh yeah. Oh, there you go. Someone's asking about T-shirts. So you know. Oh, and Jack the Rabbit said they they have uh, metal three D printers. I, I I was aware that there was something like that, but yeah. I mean, in general, uh, in order to produce the pedal that costs what our pedals cost, uh, the entire product, um, what I pay for it, needs to come in around ten bucks. So when I'm buying them in quantity, the enclosure, the drilling the powder coating and the, uh, uh, what's that called? Digital print total 10 bucks. That, well, that's not always easy to, to get. I mean, there, there's a, it's pretty, and that's a die cast enclosure, you know, I mean, die cast enclosures. Uh, I mean, that, that's one of the prime reasons that Bill Finnegan doesn't make the old style clone anymore that he probably could sell for a thousand dollars or more a piece. No problem is because it was such a pain to get those die cast enclosures made custom. So, I, getting something. I'd be, will, like I'd be willing. To, I'd be willing to melt down my 1970s uh, Hot Wheels collection if you need to like, make some. <laughs> that, that might be worth a lot more than what a typical. I, uh, the enclosures before they're painted, before they're uh, drilled or anything like that, they're usually like four bucks. My cost. Mm -hmm. So you know, it, it, it's um, yeah, it, it, they can't be expensive. My cost, if you want the pedals to be able to sell. For all you know, 140 bucks, you know, at the store, you know, and that's why that's what I wanted to get into. We're all grateful that you're cost conscious because you don't like the word boutique, so I but I have to use it because it's the one that makes the most sense for what the how you build your pedals and the cost of your pedals is amazing, like it, it is, it is a deal. And so, for you to like really scrutinize all of those elements to make sure that you can continue to produce a high quality product and still keep that price at an attractive point. Is, is a great, so you, you say you're not great at the Shark Tank thing. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, the Shark Tank thing would have them uh, at, at a lot higher price. And, a lot, and most of the other guys who build pedals, especially the way I do, um, there's a lot of artistry involved. And, you know, so a, a lot of what we do is aimed at people that would, you know, appreciate, you know, the type of work that goes into something like this, where there's, there's actually wiring involved, there's through hole parts. And, you know, uh, Aside from the debate of whether a through hole part or a surface mount part right. sounds any different or whether they function any different, it's still a type of artistry 
You know, uh, a, a person could easily argue that a factory built guitar is no different th than one that was constructed by a luthier, that, you know, that does every little bit by hand, but you know, it's the artistry as part of it. And so to be able to bring in a pedal uh, or an electronic product that's made with all that artistry and all that uh, care and the number of steps to make sure that uh, it has really good quality control at that price, it's, it's really difficult. There's not a lot of profit in it for me. And for the dealers I work with, people should know, they don't make a lot of money. It's, it's, it's not, so for anybody who's thinking about becoming a dealer, I just killed myself um, <laughs> on that one. You won't be making money. Um, but, you know, so I work with dealers that are also uh, pretty good about, you know, not trying to make, you know, double their margin or more. You know, that's, well, not, that's not something that's available because that's one of the reasons why they, you know, can make it to customers at the price that they do. Kind of speaking around that question, my, my pal Ken guys chimed in and said, what's the best way to purchase your pedals? For, you know, do you... You do a little bit of direct sales. You do dealers. Like, what is the preferred? Yeah, so we can sell them to people direct. Um, all they have to do is email me, and I send them a um, a PayPal invoice. They pay the invoice, and we ship them the pedal, uh, usually by the postal service priority mail. Uh, and then we have dealers who take all kinds of credit cards and uh, fancy types of uh, payments. Some of them offer free shipping. We don't offer free shipping. Um, <laughs> And uh, most of the dealers I work with tend to try to keep pretty recent stock. I have some guys like Music Toys orders from me almost every single week. Uh, Gear Tree orders every couple of weeks. Um, and uh, I'm having a little bit of a mind meltdown at the moment. But there's other dealers. They're on our dealers page. Um, but, you know, there's some guys who buy from us every single, uh, you know, week. Uh, and so they have pretty recent stock. But... Yeah, so our dealers page is one way to find uh, products we're buying directly from us. Uh, there's not a lot of stock at the moment. I mean, it's easy to sell through when you can't get enclosures and when you can't make anything. Right. So a couple other uh, – that Pat got the one. Uh, Sorry. The other two things – there was two other things that I saw in there that I wanted to mention. Well, first of all, Uncle Bry wants a camouflage – camouflage version of the game changer but I, I don't <laughs> get right on there <laughs> right uh send it to me, i'll get a marker out and then we'll send it out then uncle bry uh, but uh, there's great profit in making just one of something yes <laughs> in this last hour you become a marketing genius that's the, yeah, benefit, really. the value that we add and then there was one other thing oh i can't remember it's weird oh the t-shirts People want t shirts. Then people are asking if they can buy t shirts or where the t shirts are and telling you to get on some t shirts. Another, another bad Shark Tank moment for Dave. I don't have any merch. And everybody tells me I need mugs. Oh, I mean, uh, yeah, I saw what you were wearing. Yeah. Josh from JHS. He sends me merch. He, See, that's know, only fair. I, I JHS merch because I don't have my own. So that's only fair. JHS promotes other people's pedals. You're promoting JHS's right. pedals. It's beautiful. So, you know, Josh is good at the Shark Tank thing. I'm bad at the Shark Tank thing. You know, so that's why I'm wearing his merch and not my own today. That's right. But I'll, I'll try to get on that. Uh, I probably can get shirts easier than I can get enclosures at the moment. So <laughs> right. maybe, maybe I'll be more of a merch salesman. Riley uh, is asking if. If there's any, he said maybe he misunderstood. So is there any way to get direct drives right now? Or are we, are we totally out? You have to uh, contact a dealer and see if you can get them. We're at least two months behind on them because we may have to. Since this one is probably not going to happen. I mean, it might. I mean, the guy might get his printer fixed and he might be able to get rid of the little halo uh, that we uh, that he says is showing up around the direct drive logo. Actually, it's showing up around the edge of the blue. If you can see that, there's like a slight halo effect uh, to it. And he's trying to get rid of that. It's not too bad on this one, but he said it's, it's pretty bad on the ones that he was making. So that's got to be gone if we're going to make them. So he says it's a problem with his uh, his printer, which is a brand new, really expensive printer. And it's just it's hard to get things fixed right now because nobody wants to stand in anyone else's space at the moment because death. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's always that, yes. Um, so you know, I'm sure as as things improve, um, maybe he'll be able to get someone to come in and try to repair his machine. In the meantime, our artist, whose name is Bronson Wagner, who I should give a uh, big shout out to, who makes pretty much all the graphics that you saw, um, with the exception of only a, a few of the older ones. Uh, but Bronson uh, is working on a simplified version of the graphic, 
to try to make it easier for this guy's printer to be able to make our enclosures. If we get that done, then within like two months, we might have uh, direct drives again. If the guy, if Ronnie can uh, drive from Maryland to Pennsylvania to pick up parts, if Britt Steele, who's the other guy who built with me, can drive from Maryland to pick up parts and they're allowed to build, you know, it's going to be a lot of different things. I mean, I can leave the, the raw materials that they'll need on my porch and not go anywhere near them and do the no hands, you know, no contact, you know, handoff of the stuff. But, you know, there's a lot more uh, logistics to work with right now to get it straightened out. And I, uh, I kind of imagine that the people that are making the enclosures might at least be partially shut down because they're, they're not answering emails this week. Mm -hmm. I, am, right. I answer emails, even though I have, I, I'll tell you what I have at the moment. I do have game changers still for sale in the cream color. Hello, cream color. And I do have tone presses in the mint turquoise, and that's the V2. I have those in stock, and dealers have those in stock. Um, I have one game changer in raw, which is a clear coat over um, the raw uh, uh, die cast. And I have, um, I have Linden EQs. These are good at the end of your signal chain, from what I understand a little bit earlier, and they're great for bass. So I want to interrupt real quick. Um, when, if you're interested, if you're waiting, like, if you're like me and you're waiting for the new Barber Electronics Direct Drive to come out, I have noticed over the years that when you get these things, they're going to go up on your Facebook. Yeah, you'll make people aware. So, going to his Facebook, I mean, just go to Facebook and type in Barber. I, I know I didn't put the link in the description, but. If you type in Barber Electronics in the Facebook, you'll find the page Barber Electronics and Be Custom, I think is what it's called on Facebook. Um, follow his page, and when he has them in stock, he'll put them up there and let you know. And sometimes you get like those special one off things, or you, you do post some you know, special runs of things and stuff like that, too, right? I'll, I'll, I'll probably be putting some um, one offs. I'll be putting up these on the Facebook page as a set of four. Um, uh, and some other things that I have that are unique around the shop. I'll probably be putting some B stock stuff up to keep things fun. Um, and I usually save that stuff. Normally what happens is throughout the year, if I have any B stock, and we don't tend to have a ton, but we do have some, I usually save it for the black Friday sale. And that's usually like a big party for a couple of days and we have really good prices, but this might be a good time since people don't have, since everybody has only $1,200, um, <laughs> I figure this might be a good time to uh, make those things uh, available. Yeah, um, the, stimul the stimulus check was made uh, comments a couple times during this chat, and it's been lots of memes out on the internet that they know what the musicians are going to do with their checks. So oh, that's right. Please use the David, David Barber. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's Barber, B A R B E R. Send it right to David. <laughs> So what you do. <laughs> Are we out of questions? Well, uh, somebody was asking about the website again because I didn't. So I was going to throw that in. The, uh, barberelectronics.com. <laughs> <It's, laughs> um, I'm helpful. Uh, the qu there is a question. Jason's trying to multitask. Uh, Magic Matt was saying, uh, will the blue direct drive be different than version four other than the color? No, the V4, um, I'm still loving that. And it seems like everybody that, that's getting those is really uh, in love with that, with that sound. I mean, that really covered a lot for us. It allowed me to introduce um, the new four input style sound, which is definitely, well, there went the beard. Um, He's back. He'll be back. <laughs> that's um, his good side. Oh, I, I like it. <laughs> um, I needed water. Um, so uh, that's got that four input sound, which is more like an old JTM 45 type sound or like an early uh, uh, like EL34 style sound, depending on the amp that you plug it into. I mean, because the amp has a lot of impact, whether like the direct drive is providing a certain type of texture and gain structure, but your amp is deciding you know, what kind of response, how dynamic is it, um, what type of EQ structure exists. I mean, the amp has a lot of impact on what an overdrive pedal sounds like. So does the speaker. I mean, a really good dealer that I used to have used to always have this joke uh, when people were going through their um, trying to buy, they, they would buy amps from him. He, he was the sole salesman for Clark Amplification. 
And he would always tell them, well, the speaker is the only part of the entire rig that makes a noise and that people overlook it. You know, people think that the speaker isn't important, but it really shapes the EQ. It shapes how fizzy it is. It shapes um, if it's going to be tight. Uh, it definitely shapes whether it's <laughs> dynamic or not. So, um, you know, it's one of those things that I can make an overdrive pedal that does, you know, certain things with sustain and with texture, but there's a lot to be said by that final speaker and also by the way the amp shapes it. And so that's a really imp important uh, factor. Yeah, one thing you learned in our interview with David is he repaired amps back in the day and has ripped them all apart as well, in case you can't tell. But Jason's got his... Uh, I was just grabbing that, which is... Which I like, which is not the original. So the original one of these that I bought, I actually drove down to your shop and picked up from you. Uh, and I think it, it was a, it was a, it was a B stock because I don't think the screws on that one will screw in. And so I have like electrical tape holding the back plate on. That would make it a B stock. <laughs> uh, and I think I paid full price for it. And you were surprised by that when we talked and I was thinking about it more. I bought that. I, I believe it was right after, didn't guitar player or somebody do like a big article on your hand wired? Oh, yeah. And they were $99. Yeah. Um, I think they were flying off your shelves after, right after that article. And I drove down yeah. and whoever helped me, it wasn't you. You, you weren't there. I was um, on a bike ride, I'm sure. It was probably the other guy that's in the chat. He probably took advantage of me, but he. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go Ronnie, go over yeah, no, They were great. They were great the day I came down, and um, you know they were flying off the shelves. I was happy to. I mean, ninety nine dollars for a hand wired pedal. Who cares if the mm -hmm. screw screw in? But then I got this later on, and this is like the first one, right? The first one of the first direct drives. Yeah, we made the first few hundred like that. Um, Craig Schwartz who uh, worked with Barber Electronics from about uh, 2000 to 2004. Um, he did a lot of the, uh, he was the other graphic guy that we worked with and he hand wrote all of those. He designed the look of the Echelon amplifier. When you look at our amplifier on our Facebook page, there's a picture of the amp that we used to make. Um, all the all the graphic look of that, all of the radiuses of the Tolex and the, that was all, you know, uh, Craig's design. And, and he's a fantastic artist, really good guitar player and has a great ear. So he would, it was, it was great having him there because he could listen to things and tell me, you know, uh, how he felt people would respond to it. It's always good to have somebody to kind of bounce ideas off of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Pat picked, you know, we have, so we, and then the original one falls somewhere in between. So we have like three of these kind of original ones. That's why I'm dying to get my hands on the version for now. I, you know, I've made up my mind. I have to, I have to move on. Yeah. Well, um, so one other thing I'm, I'm hoping to do at some point, just like we made this GCX, I'd like to make a little bit larger enclosure version of the direct drive at some point. Obviously we can't get anything right now, so it's not going to be anytime soon. But I'd like to make like a direct drive pro or something like that that has more knobs, um, allows you to have um, a knob for adjusting uh, the, the mid range, probably the uh, uh, note shape, uh, bass, and things like that. So uh, I like the idea of making expanded versions. Some people just really like to tweak. I'm one of those people. There's just no perfect pedal. For, a, for any specific guitar, amplifier, and player. And so the more adjustments that you have that are useful, the, the better chance you have of making a pedal that can be that overdrive pedal for, you know, I wouldn't say everyone, but for a whole lot of people for covering more. Uh, the less knobs you have, the less switches that you have, the less versatility that you have, the more you have to hope it mates to the right amp, you know, and to the right player and, and, and so forth. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I spend most of my days in my shop, not doing anything that really, you know, amounts to products. It amounts to me learning about with each guitar, what I have to do to make it work well. And I, I tend to have a lot of guitars that come through that I can work with and listen to a lot of different pickups, a lot of different players that come through that I can also listen to how they sound. It's amazing what it takes to really dial something in. And so, yeah, that V4 that you're talking about, they're going to be hopefully back sometime in the next couple of months. But I'm already thinking, you know, of, of while keeping the V4, making kind of an expanded version of that eventually too. I, I just kind of can't stop myself with overdrives. 
<laughs> yeah, well, and Pat will tell you that I'm. I, I joke like I have a three knob kind of limit. Like I, I, I'm simple minded, maybe when it comes to that. Give me three knobs, and I can I can get what I want out of it. And so I was kind of afraid of all the switches and stuff. But then with the game changer, it's easy. You know, I mean, you, you flip them until it sounds the way you want it to sound. And you're yeah. right; it, it was nice with that pedal. And actually, what I found is it's not it's not it's not a search to find the sound that sounds good to you. Yep. A search to figure out which one you're going to use best at that moment kind of thing. Cause they yeah. all sounded good. They all sounded good to us. So, um, and that's the way that direct drive V4 is. It's really easy to find a few different sounds you might want to have on stage. And, and a lot of what people end up saying to me is, can you make a way to, that I can switch between these kind of have a foot switch and, Again, that makes pedals have to get bigger. You're asking for real estate. Most people don't want more real estate. As a matter of fact, before I even came on the show today, I had a guy that uh, on our Facebook page that said, I, I don't think I can make the show time-wise, but are you going to make a mini version of the Game Changer? I saw that, yeah. So, you know, all you can do is say, yeah, of course we've thought of it. You know, people ask us to make mini stuff every day they have for the last probably close to 10 years. But it, in order to... to make the real estate that small, you're down to three knobs at best. They can't be great pots in that small of a space. Um, you can you can put toggles and things on, but it does tend to limit how good that stuff's going to be, how well protected it is from your feet. I mean, and it's this is high-end audio that you're stepping on. Right. You know, people want this stuff to look like art and then step on it and then be high-end audio that you step on. So, you know, I'm being a little, you know, kind of tongue in cheek about it, but it, there is that, that I have to be the person that, that keeps that in mind that, you know, only so much will fit inside the interior of those mini enclosures. A lot of people look at them and say, there's more space. And I'm like, well, look inside. You've got these quarter inch jacks that are enormous. Yeah, they're off. They're already offset from each other. right? Yeah. And they're huge. I mean, for where we're going with pedals, the quarter inch jack is the wrong tool for the job. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to take up that much space on the interior if you want to be able to make the best use of uh, of those mini pedals. I mean, that's one of the big problems is when you look inside, you go, well, the foot switch and the two jacks have taken up all the room. I got a tiny mm -hmm. amount of space to put a circuit in there and a little bit for pots, you know, and so how good can the quality be? You have to be really careful with it and understand what you're asking a, des a designer to do. I mean, the designer will, of course, do a good job of marketing it to you and say, it's the finest quality available, but you know, if it's a hundred bucks, <laughs> then maybe it's really good, but uh, finest quality seems unlikely. I like, I like that. Uh, give up their entire paycheck there for Reagan Taylor for the expanded direct drive. So, and there was a couple other comments on um, Adam Butler, one hundred percent, I guess, for the expanded. So, yeah, people like the idea of the expanded direct drive. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to do it. And um, I guess the other thing I'm, I'm contemplating is whether I do it in more of a format that's double like this. So I can put a lot more knobs on this and have a second sound that you can foot switch to. Now, as soon as you make something like this, um, this has got a, a switch over here, the channel switch that allows you to, to switch out the volume. So the output level, and, and uh, well, this was the output level over here, the volume, and then the drive level um, for two different channels. But you're sharing the tone control, the mid-range control, you're sharing the whole circuit. And that's a similar thing that I would probably consider doing on a direct drive pro um, that had two, two switches because it allows you to make a much more reasonably priced unit. As soon as you have completely independent tone controls, you start getting into a pedal that has to cost 250 to 300 dollars instead of something like this can cost under 200 bucks and that's where most people want to be sweet spot wise is they don't want to spend 300 dollars for a pedal i mean they do but you know especially from us they're often thinking come on dave bring on the good stuff for next to nothing you know right. so it's hard to uh, you know do all that so that's where the dual discrete used to come in the dual discrete was for the guys that would pick two different overdrive pedals that we make we used to make a lot more um, and then have them put into one unit by Ronnie. Um, so there's a lot of different philosophies. There's a lot of different things that people want. There's a lot of different, you know, ways that that could be priced. But whenever we can make a lot of something, it can have a better price and still be as high a quality as anything on the market or better. 
So somebody asked earlier if there was other overdrive. But I, I think you've actually answered that question. That, like, is there other uh, other overdrive pedals that you're making your drive pedals? And I know right now it's the Game Changer, it's the Direct Drive, the Exacta Fuzz. Um, but yeah, there's other pedals coming. So if you've been and I've been following Burn Unit Electronics, Burn, Unit. Burn Unit's the number one thing we get people asking us to bring back. Right. I probably should make that before I make a pro version of the Direct Drive. So, but I mean, it's like there's always changing. There's always kind of new pedals. There's always just from the, the time that I've been following for years, it seems like if you look today at what you have online, it's totally different than what it was 10 years ago. Not totally, but considerably different. You know, because you had the burn unit and other stuff like that. Yeah, we used to have 14 products. We used to have the B buff, which was a buffer you could put inside of any pedal. Um, we had dual discretes, and there was all kinds of, of choices there. We had the Tone Press, the Trifecta, um, the Edge Hog, the Deep Fryer, which was a base overdrive, um, Burn Unit, Barbecue, uh, Launch Pad, Dirty Bomb. The list went on. Uh, all kinds of LTDs. We had the LTD Silver, the LTD, and the LTD SR. We had the Direct Drive Low Gain and the Direct Drive uh, SS, and then the standard Direct Drive. All of those things got repackaged into, you know, a game changer. It's three is four different versions of the LTD. You have an LTD, an LTD Silver, an LTD SR, and the Unlimited, all in one little box now. And that's why there's, you know, that decision anxiety of which sound will I use because I stuck, you know, four different pedals into that. Uh, when it came to the Direct Drive, the Direct Drive had. Um, the direct drive and the direct drive low gain and the direct drive super sport versions. And I took elements of all of those and put them into the direct drive V4 and included the new V4 um, for, for input sound, which is a new thing. And uh, the fact that you have uh, mid range switching now, you didn't have mid range switching available in direct drives before. The only way you could get mid range uh, was an adjustment um, trim pot on the uh, SS, which was on the interior. And then also we made something called a direct drive dual channel which I have one somewhere around here, but I couldn't find it before we uh, went live. Um, and that had a, a mid-range control on the top, like the um, like the uh, half gainer did. I'm so glad I brought these props. Yeah. Somebody said, um, well, one question was, could you put the direct drive, the Super Sport, and the direct drive low gain into one box? Well, that's kind of what the compact is, what I was just saying. I mean, that, yeah. that really uh, combines the sound. But could you have three of them for three different sounds and stuff? One, yeah, of course you can do anything. But so far, uh, Doc Holiday is the only person who asked for that. So that makes it a really expensive pedal. Can I, can I make a suggestion? And I, I think it's a reasonable suggestion. If you want to be able to run your gain changer on the low gain and the high gain and be able to switch between them, buy two. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're $149, which is a really reasonable price pedal. Um, they move to one thirty nine actually. One thirty nine. So I mean, you're 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 still cheaper than some of the uh, pedals out there that would have channel switching if you buy two. So yeah, I mean, as far as the pricing, I try to come in at a price that you would typically see on like a nice Ibanez um, tube screamer. So you can buy their like eight oh eight or their reissue of the TS nine. They're probably around a buck forty, a buck fifty, and they're made overseas. They're not made anything like the artistry of our pedals. And so that, that's always my mark is to beat them at their own game, do what they can't do. Cause what do they charge for a hand wired one? You know, once they finally do something that's more like what we do and, and without anywhere near the tweaks, not nothing is nothing against Ibanez. I mean, obviously they made this, you know, this yeah. industry is Ibanez and boss. So, but as far as, you know, what we can offer uh, as a smaller company is we can be, uh, more responsive to what guitar players want. I mean, I'm a guitar player. I spend most of my day playing guitar um, and thinking about what would I like to have when I play in the studio, when I play on stage, what would other guys look at and think, that's cool, that's what I want to have, you know, and how can we fix the problems, you know, that exist. Talent boost switch. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work for me, so maybe it'll work for others, but yeah, I'll work on that. Uh, real quick, I, I I know we're we're way beyond the hour, but we, we're Fine. very happy about that. We knew we would be. Uh, lots of engagement. We appreciate that. I love um, Adam Butler's question. 
Uh, it's interesting sometimes to see pedal engineers team up. Is there another pedal builder out there that you would like to work with? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyone? I, I wouldn't say specifically. There was a time that Paul Cochran and I uh, discussed making uh, a pedal, a type of boost that he had designed. Um, he stays really busy with um, the Timmy and things like that. Uh, and and Paul's somebody who I really like. So it, it would have been fun to work with him. Um, but it just didn't, it, the time didn't work out in logistics. Um, there's a, there's a lot of them to be honest with you. I mean, I mean, anybody who's more popular than me would be obviously good for me to work with. So, you know, uh, I, I'd be happy to team up with, with any of the guys that sell, you know, 30 and 40 and 50,000 pedals a year. I'd be crazy. Not, I'd be having an extra bad shark tank moment if I didn't say, uh, yes, uh, to that. But yeah, I like working with, with, with others just to answer that question simply, but I don't want to like start when like when your buddy Josh names and forget somebody. When your buddy Josh got teamed up with boss, for example. <laughs> that was unbelievable. I mean, the things that Josh can do, I mean, he played basketball with Paul Gilbert. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. I, I mean, it just amazes me. Josh must, must, must be just one of those guys that knows if you don't ask the question, it won't happen. He must just ask the question and things happen. I mean, I don't know how many questions he asks where people say no, you know, <laughs> in order to get the things done that he gets done. But I'm astonished by what he gets done. I'm astonished what he's done in the time that he's been in the industry. Um, he's pretty remarkable. He really is. That's that's interesting. That's maybe a great place for us to start wrapping this up, too, because if you don't ask the question, things don't happen. And so this is the second time now we've got to hang out with what I would consider, you know, the builder of my favorite overdrive pedal. So I'm like, how often does that? Thank you. Yeah. How often does that happen? Um, and it just happens that you live, I mean, kind of close by, um, maybe what, about 30, 40 minutes away. About 40 um, minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's really been fantastic, um, to, to spend time with you when you came over for, for, uh, the interview. It's been I, fantastic to do spend time with you tonight. And like, there's stuff that we haven't touched on yet. Like, I mean, there's things that we need to get into. Um, guitar fans, we need to get into like, okay, so what are those guitars? People would love to know probably what those guitars you're using over there are. Uh, this series started out as the, with the idea of being 19 conversations. Because when, when it started, there was still this idea that in 15 days, this whatever it was, I think it's going to end up being more than 19. So maybe down the road we do this again. Or we uh, put this all behind us and we get over to your place into the shop and stuff. Whatever. Any, any of the above would be fun. I really wanted to have some guitars as props to today, but I just didn't have a, a setup and I didn't know what the audio quality would be like if I brought some guitars out and, you know, tried to demo some of the uh, pedals. And you can see I ate up all this time just with my, my little pedal props that I put on the table in front of me. Yeah, it's really hard to play over the live stream because it does – even sometimes when two of us talk or something happens, you hear the sound go down. So playing never works that great. Okay. Um, but I mean, just even to show him, like Pat showed a really cool guitar yesterday. Yeah, he did. Is that sitting right next R to you? RG or whatever that uh, was? Is that well, I had the uh, 65 SG. It's across the room. Yeah, and, just, and he has the. Oh, don't worry about it. I didn't get to see the story on his white SG, but I really liked it. I love SGs. They look Where's like. A, is it a junior? Yeah, 65 uh, SG Jr. was my grandfather's. Oh, um, Arctic, man. Arctic White, all original, original case. Had the Gibson Skylark amp with it and the whole deal. Oh, man. Uh, has like a, I didn't tell everybody, but on the outside of the, at top of the amp and outside of the case, he had a, a silver plaque uh, engraved with his name on it. And I realized, I, I opened the case that my, my son came in who never got to meet his great-grandfather. And there was some uh, handwritten song lyrics in there. I don't know if it was, I didn't vet them to see if it was just a song he was learning or something he was writing. But uh, yeah, so wow, it's a pretty special guitar. I spent a lot of time in its case just because I have a lot of guitars and that single P90 was some of the stuff I did. I probably didn't find the home for it that I should, but now that it's back out of the basement and amongst the light, we'll uh, get it out a little bit more. Those are great sounding guitars. And, and I collect old Gibson amp. So when you brought up the Gibson amp too, I'm like, oh, that's the good stuff. It has a great backstory. So that's that's really cool. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad I asked about it. <laughs> so yeah, cool. I, I could definitely break out some cool guitars uh, that I use and, and show the things that I do to guitars to make them more useful for me and somebody uh, might find some some use in, in uh, of what I do to guitars because I'm 
pretty specific about um, the electronics uh, and guitars and how to make them work better, at least for, for me, for, for live. I played live probably for about uh, 20 years before I started having some problems with my ears ringing. So I backed off. I don't play live. I don't go see live performances because I want to keep my hearing in good shape. But um, there was things that I did that I realized worked well. It took a long time. Um, like we were, I was doing partial sp splits on people's guitars for years. And now you see partial splits on PRS guitars to make a humbucker split to a little bit better, a little bit more full sounding, a little bit louder, single coil sound. Exactly. Yeah, what they used to have. I was doing that stuff for years. So, and I, I know other guys were too. I wasn't the only guy. It's you know, it, it's not a, it's not a really new trick. It's just a new trick to see on a manufactured guitar, you know, at, at a factory or something like that. It's something that you typically went to your technician to do. So, um, yeah, I'd love to get the guitars out and the amps out and talk about that stuff. So there's another old uh, Gibson amp collector. Oh, Doc that's cool. Yeah. He's yeah. I've got a couple of other projects that I'm working on right now. Um, one of them, one of them is a Falcon that showed up. I wish I had the picture I could put up on the screen, but I bought it from guitar center used and they had it listed in good condition and it showed up with part of the chassis missing the power supply hanging out of it. No fuse box. The speaker was disconnected and hanging by wires in the back of it. This was good condition and it wasn't damaged by UPS. That was just the way it was. So they obviously had never plugged it in. There was rust on the interior of the fuse of what was left of the fuse box. The part of the fuse box was, was gone, but I'm going to save that one because after they realized what bad condition it was in, um, they sold it to me for strictly the price of shipping, which was 30 bucks. Mm -hmm. so I got this, this, I've got another project, just what I need. If you saw how many projects that are unfinished I have in my shop, it would just, it would only kill my Shark Tank mind. <laughs> so Ronnie said hopefully they'll be doing some demos on uh, his YouTube channel. After yeah. The mess is over, so. Ronnie's got a, a YouTube channel where he shows people how to use different audio equipment and software um, that he's just started. And he can post post a link to that if he would like. Um, Cause I don't remember the exact uh, link, but Ronnie's got a, got a great, Ronnie's a really good recording engineer and he's one of the better known recording engineers in the area. He does a lot of uh, mixing and recording for, for the, for the really the best artists around in our area in Baltimore. And I still consider myself part of the Baltimore scene cause I grew up there. And um, uh, he's offered me to, to, to bring pedals over and do the demos and make some video stuff. I, and I'm, I've been trying to embrace the idea of being on video and eventually I'll have to probably learn how to stop speaking so that can work. <laughs> or we, so, or we click on the three dots next to Ronnie's name in the chat. It will. There's a spot where you can go to his channel and you can sub that. Uh, same with Guitar Hack. Uh, I know that a lot of guys in here have uh, YouTube channels. Brian Landreth, Jack the Rabbit. Um, the, I'm not sure who else. Uh, this is where I, you know, you start doing that and then you miss somebody. That's why I typically don't do stuff like that. But if I missed you, just... You can feel free to post that. A couple uh, guys, already, a couple guys that people might want to check out. A couple guys subscribed to Ronnie's channel already while we were sitting here, so that's good. Awesome. Great. So, and if you haven't subscribed here, please do that. We are at a minute yeah. thirty-five, uh, an hour and hour. thirty-five minutes. So we did go over, but we knew Pat and I kind of knew we were going over, and we, we were with that. Um, we also don't want to take up too much of David's time, but I got we, were out, we were willing to hang out. So I have nothing to do for months. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have you on every day at four thirty. <laughs> you have to build a uh, Farber Electronics Direct Drive version four. You need to get that supply for that. <laughs> I know. Yeah, because I'm really looking forward to it. I know. Uh, hopefully, a lot of people in here are looking forward to it. So make sure you go out and check out. Barber Electronics on Facebook. Check them out on Instagram. Check them out on the web. I know I'm supposed to put those links down in the description. I'll try and get that done at some point here. Um, but if I don't, a simple search for Barber Electronics and any of those platforms will get you there. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to make it too easy on you. Uh, so with that, I mean, is there? I think I think for today, but yeah, man. there could be part two coming up or. And Brian Landreth said earlier that he sees a tour of the factory coming up. Uh, and I mean, we're hoping to get to drive down there and hang out at some point. So, 
Anything else you have to say other than, David, thank you so much again for your time. We appreciate it. You're always very gracious for your time. I'm happy to come on the channel. It was fun. What you got? You had something there. What you got? Uh, this was my diffuser on my light. My cat just pulled it down. <laughs> well, you asked about if the cat had to go upstairs or not, and the cat kind of lets you know maybe. You know, I just thought, yeah. He wants dinner. Sorry. Six o'clock is his dinner time, and it's unbelievable how well he knows when it's six o'clock. Nice. Yeah, I think I'm going to respectfully start calling you Loquacious D. Uh, that'll be your new, <laughs> your new name. It's good. It's like yeah, I love it. That's good. But we really do appreciate your time. It's great. You know, still just look back to two guys you didn't know. You made a drive in some horrific rain, crazy fog to come over and hang out and then agreed to do this. And it's really great to see all the interaction with people and all the great things that you're doing and the way you're well-respected in the industry. And for you to sit down and spend time with us, we're very grateful and we don't take it for granted. So we really appreciate that. I look forward to more, look forward to more times together. Yes, Jason. Yeah, be, before you end, because uh, I felt it coming, I, I should say to the people in here tomorrow, um, Drew Swindler's on from Swindler Effects. Drew, Drew Swindle from Swindler Effects is on, mm -hmm. doing some really cool stuff, and he does do like those time based and the modulation things. Um, next week, maybe, uh, an, uh, th maybe it, it, it's looking like Dave Sestito will be on sometime next week. Um, and there's some other things going on that we'll hopefully have some other people on. So just keep watching. We're going to have, please subscribe. We're doing these conversations every day and trying to bring some cool people on for you. Um, and that's what I forgot. Other than that, right. I've been hit the bell sort of out of our little rhythm since, but we're getting into newer than with these conversations. So thanks again to David Barber for joining us today. And I'm PJ on behalf of the beard reminding you, no matter what you hear, you never have too much gear, especially if it says Barber electronics on it. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one, everybody. Wash your hands.